Looking back, I think we, just, we accomplished most of what we set out to do, and I'm, uh, I feel like the state's in better shape than when we got here. And looking ahead. I'd like to see the Republican Party get back to its roots and be a bigger uh, tent that's more inclusive, that has a more hopeful, positive vision for America. A pandemic, civil unrest, and hard-fought battle with cancer later. Governor Larry Hogan offers a reflection of his eight years leading Maryland and what the future may hold. Should Republicans want to turn back to like more, more, a more Mitt Romney style Republican, that Hogan is one of the only Republicans who currently have no connection with the former Trump administration. Sure. Leaving behind a legacy as a so-called blue state Republican, Dr. Malia Cromer offers her insights what Governor Hogan's time in office may signal to the Republican Party. And hello everyone, I'm Jason Newton. Welcome to this edition of 11 TV Hill. A changing of the guard of sorts in Annapolis. Come January, Governor Larry Hogan will hand the keys to the governor's mansion to Governor-elect Wes Moore. Now, last week, the Hogans gave the Moore family the first tour of their soon-to-be new home. That included a look at the seven state rooms, drawing rooms, dining and reception areas, as well as the conservatory and parlor. The governor showed us all the different rooms where, you know, you can have legislators or you can have business leaders or community groups. And so it's exactly how uh, exactly how I plan on using it, where, you know, this is the people's house and we want to make sure that the people are, are being able to take full advantage of it as well. Now, it's moments like these that become moments of reflection. Earlier this month, I sat down with Governor Hogan for an exit interview of sorts, and he shared his thoughts on the past eight years serving Maryland and offered some hints of what could be in his future outside of Annapolis. Governor Hogan, good to see you. It's great to see you, Jason. I don't know if you remember the first time you and I met. It was at a uh, debate uh, at MPT. Yeah, uh, me, you, Anthony Brown, a few of our close friends there. I remember that one. Uh, my question was, <laughs> what the heck were you thinking then? What was going through your mind as you stepped up to that podium? And, and this would be this would be your entree into the governor's match. Well, uh, you know, obviously, when you when I was first going up there, I was a little nervous. You know, I had no experience <laughs> doing this stuff before. But uh, you know, after. You know, I just wanted to kind of, you know, tell people, you know, what my answers to the questions were. Yeah. After it was over, I felt really good because, you know, people seemed to think we did a pretty good job in the debate. It was a big, you know, kind of a relief and, you know, I didn't screw up and I made it through there <laughs> right. pretty good. <laughs> did, could you feel the momentum? I mean, from that point on, did you feel like uh, well, this was attainable? Because I remember I read a quote about you at the Dundalk uh, yeah, Festival Parade. Yeah. And that's when you thought, okay, people are, they're digging me a little bit. Well, you know, I, you know no one... There probably wasn't a soul that believed that a Republican was going to get elected in Maryland, and uh, we were outspent by seven to one. Sure. With, you know, Anthony Brown, and it's a two and a half to one Democratic state. It's the bluest state in America, and I was a guy who never held office. Uh, so, you know, but at that debate, I felt I got a little confidence. I think people saw me for the first time, but we were out there meeting people everywhere, sure. all across the state, and it kept feeling better. And then we went into Dundalk, which is a very heavily democratic, kind of blue collar, working class, you know, it was people that were, you know, their families were union members and a lot of people had lost their jobs and they hadn't really voted for a Republican in 70 years or something, but they were thousands of them standing up and cheering because we were talking about the things that they cared about, about jobs and taxes and supporting small businesses. And uh, I, I just had a feeling no one else believed it even after in t until election night. But I, <laughs> I started to feel in July that, hey, maybe we're, people are starting to listen. Sure. I ran off. You and I spoke after that. And you know, we thought you had, were up against some things to manage. And then the list got longer. So yeah. there's COVID and cancer. There was a yeah. civil unrest. There's yeah. bipartisanship. There's a Trump presidency. Uh, how, how does one keep a level head through all that? How did you manage that? You know, so that we, we had a whole plan of all the things we wanted to accomplish and, you know, what, you know, we wanted to focus on turning the economy around. We, but the, all these challenges hit from out of the blue that we never imagined. Like we never, we never imagined, uh, you know, we were going to have, you know, violence uh, break out in our largest city 89 days after I was governor. And then, and then 60 days after that, you know, I got hit with a, you know, life threatening uh, cancer situation. And then a couple of years later, we're, we're dealing with, the worst global pandemic in a hundred years. Uh, all of them were challenges, but you know we just had to keep uh, trying to make the right decisions and you know 
uh, it was sometimes very difficult decisions yeah. and it kept plowing ahead. But uh, it, it seems as if mo most people in Maryland, you know, they, they approve of, you know, the way we've handled all those challenges. Sure. For people who come after you as governor, we have learned that it is a tough relationship between the State House and City Hall in Baltimore. It's it, naturally tough. Is there something uh, that you would tell the next person when it comes to relating to folks in the city and finding some middle ground between the two? Yeah, I talked with uh, the incoming governor about that yeah. uh, because it was frustrating for me that we didn't have uh, more success in Baltimore. You know, we, I made a conscious effort to work with all four mayors. You know, it's, sure. it's funny to say, but I've only been here eight years, but we've been through four mayors and five police commissioners. And, but I've you know, tried to reach out. We've had lines of communication with all of them. We put more money into Baltimore than any governor in history. Uh, more money into the schools or, you know, two or three times what the rest of the state gets per student. We put $1.5 in public safety and, it, you know, uh, responded to every single request from the mayors. But there was sometimes a, a di disconnect or a conflict. They didn't you know, uh, support some of our policies that we thought would be important. But I told, you know, Wes Moore that, you know, perhaps that was something he could uh, have a better chance at success at. He could try to work with the leaders and maybe they would uh, listen to him more. Uh, but I, I think that it's very important. I mean, the city of Baltimore is critical to the state of Maryland. And, you know, uh, we still got some real challenges there. Still ahead on 11 TV Hill, our conversation with the governor continues.